Welcome back to Close Up. The challenger in this race and the apparent favorite, at least in the Democratic caucus, is a former executive counselor and the 2016 Democratic nominee for governor, Colin Van Ostern. Colin, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So uh, you've been making your case to the reps and the senators, and that's where the votes are. Mm -hmm. uh, the people don't necessarily have a direct vote in this. Yeah. Uh, explain why you believe it's in the interest of the people to have change at the Secretary of State's office. Well, I think many folks recognize we need a modern and accountable Secretary of State's office and a secretary who will do a better job of fighting for the rights of our voters and our local election officials. I saw that up close as an executive counselor for the state. Uh, and I've also seen a lot of confusion and controversy in recent years. You think about the town meeting snow day mess that we had last year and the year before. Uh, I think we can do a, a lot better job by bringing some clarity. Uh, and sometimes after 42 years, change is helpful. So uh, two of the main arguments right now against your candidacy, uh, one of those uh, would be uh, your background is partisan. You're a dedicated Democrat. Uh, and that's true for Bill, too. He was a Democratic state rep true, when he was true, but he's elected. kind of evolved to a point now where a lot of Democrats are angry at him. I don't think <laughs> you know, the Democrats certainly aren't claiming him in, in any regard right now. But can you point to anything you've done in your career that will assuage some of these fears on the Republican side that you would somehow put your finger on the scale maybe for Democrats, even in the yeah. smallest way? Well, I'm proud to have Republicans who are supporting me in this race, too, and he'll be voting for me next week. Uh, when I was an executive counselor for four years, I think I confirmed 22 different judges. I literally couldn't tell you which are Republicans, Democrats, or independents, but my guess is there are some of all three. I certainly cast votes against my party, and most of the votes on the executive council aren't like a legislative caucus. There's no legislative leadership or anything like that. Um, I've always tried to f focus on who I think is the right person for the job and put forward real specific issues. In this race, I'll give you an example. My proposal is to have a nonpartisan director of the elections division in the office. We do that in several other offices within the Secretary of State's office, like vital records or archives, where someone has to be approved for a four-year term, be professionally qualified, go through the governor and council process. But right now, effectively, the elections division is just managed by a political appointee. So I think that sort of specific proposal, what I've heard from legislators, is that's the sort of thing they want to hear and see about how our next Secretary of State will administer the office. Uh, the other main argument being made against your candidacy is on the money side. You, you focused on fundraising and kind of treated this like uh, a modern statewide race, which in, in some ways it kind of is, although there are only 424 votes here. Uh, why did you decide to go big on the fundraising when there are just 424 votes involved? Well, I know when you're taking on an incumbent who's been there for 42 years that that's going to be an uphill effort. Uh, it has been from day one. Every single state representative who just got elected has stopped by his office and talked to him in the days leading up to this vote. I don't have an office in the state house. I don't have a staff of assistant and deputy secretaries to help me. Uh, so we've raised grassroots contributions from here in New Hampshire. We've used them to host uh, legislators and candidates of all parties at forums around the state to talk about these issues. What we can do to better protect the rights of our local election officials and our voters and our business people. And we've heard great positive feedback from it. Is your political action committee going to remain active during the first in the nation primary process? Uh, not if I'm elected, no. So essentially you would not be accepting donations from Correct. people running for president of the United States? No. So um, under all of that unease, uh, under that uh, sort of aura of the, uh, the office, being involved in the First Nation primary. That's an argument being made by Republicans right now as well. Lose Bill Gardner, maybe we lose the primary. What do you say in response to that? Uh, no one man is responsible for our primary. It's a team effort. The star player of the team is the people of New Hampshire. Secretary Gardner has done a great job on the primary for many decades, and whoever our next secretary will be, and it'll be me or somebody else, there'll be somebody else after Bill, uh, that person's going to have that same responsibility to faithfully execute our state law, which requires the Secretary of State to set the primary date a week before any similar contest. Uh, for what it's worth, this is also something that's personal to me. Uh, my wife and I literally got married in Dixville Notch, feet from the ballot room where the first votes are cast every four years. Uh, I care passionately about it, not because it's good for New Hampshire, but because it's good for American democracy. One of the issues you bringing up in this campaign is, is the uh, audits of yeah. the Secretary of State's office, or lack thereof. Uh, in his own defense, Bill Gardner has said that he can't just request uh, the of state to come can. in there. But um, what would you be doing in that regard uh, day one if you were elected? Uh, well, we have to do exactly that, is to request an audit. The last audit was uh, over 11 years ago. It had 30 different significant deficiencies and material weaknesses in it. There has been no outside or independent follow-up. And I mean serious things. Money being put in the wrong accounts, vendors being overpaid. Uh, some of the quotes from that are alarming. And in any other organization, if you're leading the organization and those are the results of an audit, uh, you absolutely have to have further outside independent review. And uh, 
I think that lack of accountability is what we've seen, unfortunately, in too many areas in that office. It's not just the audits. But the issue with the town meeting snow day mess was that in 2017, 80 town officials moved their town meeting during a blizzard uh, because they wanted to keep people safe. Nothing changed in our law. But the Secretary of State had a new interpretation of the law a year later and prohibited them from moving. One man's judgment shouldn't be superseding the checks and balances that we have to have throughout our state government. The snow voting situation. Yeah. What is the appropriate way forward on that? Because certainly someone has to lead, someone has to yeah, organize we, we these elections. We need to elections. trust local officials better than we have. We need to have communication with our local officials. There are provisions in state law right now, which Secretary Gardner's interpretation is that it didn't allow moderators to do what it says in the state law they can do, which is if there's a severe blizzard, they can move the date. And 80 towns did that in 2017, and were successful in doing it. Um, uh, there's no question we need more clarity, but here's the thing that concerns me the most. In this campaign, Secretary Garner has offered zero new ideas for the future about how to strengthen the office, and that's a great example as to why. We've had a mess for two years on town meeting day, and he has not offered any proposals on that issue or any other issue about how we're going to have positive change for the future. And I, I have tried to be really specific in this campaign about some of the things that we can do, a new website, audits, a director of the elections division, strengthening control for local officials, because I think this is, election is about the changes we we need to make for the future. So uh, you said in previous interviews that the things you would like to do in this office will probably take more than two years, even though you don't want to presume that you would be elected more than once because this has to happen every two years. Uh, we know you've had your sights set in a different corner office in the past. So uh, what assurances can you give without stepping on that two-year kind of window, knowing that you have to face election again and again? But what assurances can you give that this position isn't one you're just going to be using to launch yourself into another race at some point in 2022 or beyond. If I have the honor to be elected into this office, it will be my only focus 100% of the time. Uh, aside from being a dad uh, and being a husband, uh, I'm going to pour everything that I have into being a good Secretary of State. I will not run for any other office for that job, from that job. And, uh, you know, I only can ask for a two-year term. I do think it will probably take more than two years to bring some of the changes that we need after 42 years of one Secretary. Uh, and my hope would be to ask our next legislature if I have the opportunity to serve, to serve again. But, you know, that's going to be up to the 424 people who vote next week. And given the election sensitive nature, uh, you know, because it, I guess there's nothing wrong essentially with being political and ambitious. It happens. People run for different offices. But should the Secretary of State, if they do have their eye on another office, should they resign and step down as soon as they begin thinking about that? Or is that something that they can consider? Um, in office. Well, I don't think there's any they. I think it's either me or Bill Gardner. Or I guess it could I'm be somebody else in the future. I, yeah. I can tell you how I would approach it, which is I'm never going to run for any other office from this one. Uh, I think that we have this has to have 100% full devotion of anyone serving in the office. Uh, and I also think the fact that literally the only thing Bill has said about the future, the only thing Secretary Gardner has proposed is that he won't run for another office. But he hasn't offered any concrete policy ideas for how to strengthen the actual real challenges are citizens are facing in 2019 and 2020. And when I meet with the lawmakers who are going to cast this vote, that's what they ask me about. They, they ask me, you know, they tell me about, somebody told me about a rural doctor in the western part of the state who has to take three or four times every time he uploads a death certificate on the Secretary of State's vital records website because it just doesn't work most of the time. We need a secretary who has concrete plans for how to fix these things. So Secretary Gardner has been office for a long time. You've yeah. noted that uh, one of the seemingly anachronistic aspects of his leadership that seems to have broad appeal is that his door is always open. Yeah. You can walk in there and pretty much see him without an appointment or anything like that. Yeah. Does that tradition continue? Yeah, if you're the Secretary and there are plenty of things he's done well that I like. Uh, and I don't think this should be one of those political campaigns where you just everyone tries to tear the other person down. I think he's done a great job on the primary. Uh, I think for many decades he served our state in an admirable way. Um, and I think something like an open-door policy is a great policy to have. Uh, I also know the real situation that we're facing in 2018 and 2019 and 2020, uh, and we need someone who's going to do a better job of protecting the rights of our voters and our local officials and running a modern and accountable office. Okay, Colin Van Ostern, candidate for Secretary of State. Thank All you. All right, we'll see how this turns out on December 5th. See you soon.